Early in his life, Ezra Taft Benson was taught the importance of righteous living. The teachings and experiences of his boyhood established a firm foundation for his later years of church service. I have been richly blessed all my life. As the oldest of 11 children, we had what I believe is as nearly perfect a family life as people have in this world. We were fully united. We had great love and respect and honor and cooperation for each other. Father and mother had started out humbly, but they had two rooms built before they were married. They moved in to a home already furnished. Mother had made the carpet and made the linen and so on and had everything ready when they moved into the two rooms. And we, we never left that home. We just built on to it as the family increased. One of the very great highlights in our life was the call that came to my father to go on a mission. I recall it so well. There was a, uh, an epidemic in the community. I think it was chicken pox. But on some theory, the parents were allowed to go to sacrament meeting, but the children were uh, to stay home. And I remember father and mother going to sacrament meeting in the one horse buggy. And as, um, which was the custom in the little town, there was only one store in the town. There was no RFD. And the post office was in the store. And the storekeeper would open the store long enough for the farmers to get their mail. Uh, they couldn't buy anything. It was the Sabbath. So they'd get their mail and I'd save them, save the farmers a trip to the store. And on the way home, father was driving the horse and mother was opening the mail. And here was a letter from Box B. That was a call to go on a mission. No one asked you if you were ready or willing or able. Uh, the bishop was expected to know. And so as they drove into the farmyard, we saw something we had never seen in our family, both father and mother in tears. We gathered around the buggy, and I being the oldest, I was spokesman, and asked them what was wrong. Oh, they said, everything is just fine. Then why are you crying? Come into the house, and we'll tell you. And I remember, as though it were yesterday, the seven children sitting in front of the couch while father and mother told us what had happened. And Mother says, we're very proud to think that Father is worthy, considered worthy to go on a mission. And Father says, uh, we're crying a little because, you know, Mother and I have never been separated in all of our married life, more than two nights at a time. And that's when I've gone in the canyon to get poles for derricks and posts for fences. And this means two years of separation. Father went on his mission sold part of the farm to finance it. There came into that home a spirit of missionary work that never left it. And I remember sitting around the old kitchen table after supper, and the chores were done, mother reading letters from father, from what seemed to us children halfway around the world. But it was only Des Moines, Iowa, uh, Cedar Rapids, Springfield, Illinois, Chicago, Northern States Mission. One of the very happy times, of course, is when Father returned from his mission. And I remember so well as we would sit there milking cows, the Armstrong method. He would sing those great missionary songs. Ye elders of Israel, 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 God is calling. Come all ye sons of God, I'll go where you want me to go. Till I learned the words of every one of those great songs. And, of course, we always, it seemed to us, we were always going to church in the white top buggy. Father was very, very punctual. He set the time when the white top buggy and the team would leave. 
and the children knew they were expected to be ready. Sometimes, if one or two of the children were a little bit slow, he'd start the team up very gently. I can still see some of them running to catch up with the buggy so they could get to Sunday school or SAGMA meeting. But it was a very happy, uh, joyful experience we had. It was a Mormon community. There was one non-member in the community, and he finally succumbed. But we had a, a great spirit in the community. I remember well digging trench for the water line. We installed it. The families installed it. I remember when we got the uh, poles out of the canyon, which we used for the electric light line. I remember well when Mother pulled the first chain and the first light came on. I remember her standing at the dish sink when she turned the tap. And the tears rolled down her cheeks. So uh, we had done the things ourselves. We'd even established our own telephone system. We put the line in, strung the wires. We had one technician to help us. It was a very progressive community and uh, a good place to live, a good place to rear a family, a good place to be part of a family. So it was a very happy boyhood, which was mine, shared by the other 10 children. As a young man, he attended Utah State University. It was there he met Flora Smith Amison. After seven years of courtship and missionary service, they were married on September 10, 1926, in the Salt Lake Temple. We didn't go to school the full college year. Utah State was only 25 miles away, but we were working in the harvest, in the fall, planting in the spring. I took correspondence courses and uh, went mostly winter quarters. And I was down at one time uh, with my more affluent friends who went before the air, uh, spending a weekend. We were out at the barns. And this is the first time I ever saw the girl who was to be my wife. And a young lady drove by in a Ford pickup. Ford car. And these fellows, my friends, waved to her. And she came back in a, in a few minutes, and they waved to her again. And I said, who is that girl? She said, that's Flora. They said, that's Flora Amison. I said, uh, I have a strong impression that I'm going to marry her. She's going to become my wife. And I said, if I come down here this winter quarter, I'm going to step her, just like that. And I want to repeat what one of them said. He said, like H.U.L., she's too popular for a farm boy. I said, that makes it all the more interesting. And that was the end of the conversation. But that's the first time I ever saw her. And it was some time before I got my first date. But she first came to our community with a cousin of mine. They were going to BYC at the same time. There used to be a, a BY college, you know, which was a junior college. And um, so I had met her, but um, I didn't know her. I'd never had a date with her, a formal date. And so I was staying with my grandmother, Grandmother Benson. She was a widow. And, um, and my sister Margaret was staying there also. And she and I were, would go out to parties together. And I just took it for granted she'd always be there. So one time at dinner, I said, Margaret, I understand there's going to be a party down at BYC. Let's go. She said, well, I'm going. I almost felt like I'd been jilted. And so I thought, well, who in the world do I know in this town? I want to go to that party. It, they were making the awards to the football players. And then I thought, 
of this girl. And uh, I called her. And she said, well, I was not planning to date because I have to make the awards to the football players. She was the vice president of the student body. And um, I said, well, I'll be glad to sit out while you make the awards. In other words, I wouldn't take no for an answer. And she finally accepted. And we went together. That was my first date. And uh, it was a very happy one. We had uh, seven glorious years of courtship. And of course, I went on a mission for 30 months. Great Britain came home, and we were resuming our courtship. And uh, she was called on a mission. But however, in both missions, we agreed to write once a month. And that's what we did. She was going to be busy, and I was going to be busy. And we thought one letter a month would be just right. We followed it right through. And I recommend it. But it was a, it was a happy courtship. As we look back on it, we're grateful to the Lord for every hour and every afternoon and day we spent together. Well, I always said I wanted to marry a poor man materially, but rich spiritually. He said you not only married a poor man, but you married a man in debt. <laughs> and I soon found that out, but it was worthwhile. We were so happy together, and we lived on $70 a month, and you take seven off from that, that was the amount we lived on. And That's when we went to Ames. Ames, Iowa, and I'd never seen cockroaches before, but they were there. <laughs> and we were so happy. I'm so blessed to have such a wonderful husband. We wanted 12 children. We set our goal for 12. But the Lord only sent us six. My wife says if we could only had twins every time, we'd have made it. But uh, we have 34 grandchildren and just received our 10th great-grandchild. We're very, very blessed, we feel. They're just choice spirits. And I believe there are a lot of choice spirits coming into the homes of the Mormon people, the Latter-day Saints today. They're not just ordinary young people. They're choice spirits. I received that testimony as I've been talking to them in various parts of the world. Quite recently in Europe, several times. So, um, I think that the Mormon people, the Latter-day Saints, are blessed because of the quality of children coming into their homes. In 1943, at age 44, he was called to serve as a member of the Council of the Twelve and ordained an apostle. Thirty years later, in 1973, he was sustained and set apart as president of the Council of the Twelve. My service in the church has been one of joy and satisfaction from the very beginning. First as a stake president, then again as stake president in the mission field. The biggest shock of my life, of course, and the most humbling experience was to be called into the twelve. I had such a th thought had never entered my mind that I would ever be called as a general authority. I was national director of the National Council of Farmer Cooperatives, which is a federation of 4,600 marketing and purchasing organizations. I had been uh, offered um, advancements in the cooperative movement, and um, one of them particularly attracted me. It would take me into active management in an organization that covered several seven states. I had a, memo, a memorandum in my pocket to ask one of the brethren when I came to Salt Lake, as I was coming to Salt Lake, we were holding meetings in the western states, uh, to ask one of the brethren if there'd be any objection if I should take a job which would take me out of Washington and require me to be released as state president back there. And um, before I had an opportunity to ask anyone, I was told that President Grant wanted to see me. 
and uh, that I'd be picked up and taken to his home by his, I think, son-in-law, Brother Cannon. He went up to the Grant home and then came out again and started to get in the car. I said, where are you going? He says, oh, President Grant's up the canyon. I said, I'm sorry. I'm afraid I don't have time to go up the canyon. I've got an appointment in Grand Junction tonight. Oh, he says, as long as you take a minute, he's right at the mouth of Immigration Canyon. And so we, we drove up quickly. President Grant was in the bedroom alone. And uh, I was asked to go in. He was lying on the bed and asked me to pull a chair out close to him, which I did. He took both my hands in his. Says, Brother Benson, with all, with all my heart, I congratulate you. You have been called as the youngest apostle in the church. And uh, I don't know that we said much more. I cried and he cried. And the spirit was there. As I had never felt it before in my life. And then finally he said we've been worried because the decision was made some time ago. And um, then he gave me some instructions as to what to tell President McKay. That I was to have dinner with President McKay that night. Another thing that was counting. But um, it has been the choicest of all human relationships. Except the relationship with your own eternal companion. I think there isn't anything to compare with it. The relationship we have, especially in the 12. A great group of band with great devotion and dedication and loyalty. Any one of them, I would be willing to serve under and support them as leader of the 12. And uh, so I have a great love with them. I remember when Brother Lee was called, we had been schoolmates up in Preston, the old United States Academy. So we threw our arms around each other. I told him how proud I was of him. But even at that time, I never dreamed that the call would ever come to me. It had never entered my mind. It is a glorious experience. There's no brotherhood anywhere in the world, I think, to compare with it. It's one of the sweetest things that can happen to a human being. And I know that. To hear the testimonies of my brethren is a glorious experience. In addition to his love of the gospel, President Benson has always felt a great love for his native land. In 1952, with the approval of President David O. McKay, Elder Benson accepted an invitation from the President of the United States to serve as Secretary of Agriculture. Of course, we missed very much being with the Twelve during those years in Washington. President McKay, however, said, if the call comes in the proper spirit, I think you should accept. I said, President McKay, I can't believe it will come. And, uh, and I really hope it won't. And so when I went back to Washington for, the, uh, for what I thought was an interview, I found the whole thing was settled in the minds of the president. And I made up my mind I was going to express to him the feelings, the reservations I had. So I expressed them frankly. I said, um, General, President-elect, I have already received a greater honor than you can offer. And I told him what a call to the 12 meant. 
And I said, I have four good reasons why I think I shouldn't be Secretary of Agriculture. And I want you to hear them. I said, in the first place, I didn't support you for the presidency. Not because you're not a good man. I didn't know you. I supported Senator Taft. Not because I have Taft in my name, but because I knew Senator Taft. I knew he was a statesman. I knew he'd make a great president. And I said, secondly, thirdly, I wonder if it's wise for you to select a secretary from the state of Utah. Utah is a much less important state agriculturally than the states of the Midwest. That's the heartland of agriculture. Wouldn't it be better for you to select a secretary back there? And I says, thirdly, fourthly, I wonder what the other churches will think. I said, to me, the Mormon church means everything. But I said, while well, we're growing very rapidly, which pleases me, we're a comparatively small church. And I wonder what the reaction will be to some of the larger churches. Well, he didn't mention the first items I mentioned. He said, you mean to tell me our job isn't spiritual? He said, we've got the job to try and restore confidence in the minds of their own people and their own government. And if that isn't spiritual, I don't know what it is. He said, I want you on the team. You can't say no. He said, you can't refuse to serve America. I said, Mr. President, that's true. I've said that to others. And in 30 minutes, we were out before the cameras. It was all over. And, uh, but I made the commitment for two years. And every time uh, two years expired, <laughs> I'd try again. And um, he would not have it. Well, I have said many times what Eisenhower said to me. You can't refuse to serve America. I love this country. With all my heart, I love it. I know that this is the Lord's base of operations in these latter days. And that's why I titled one of my books, This Nation Will Endure. I don't think the Lord wants this nation to uh, be destroyed. Of course, we live in a wicked world. And the greatest evil in this world is the communist threat, without any question. And um, I'm so grateful for the knowledge we have as Latter-day Saints. We know that the constitution of this land was established by men whom the God of heaven raised up into this very purpose. Those are almost the Lord's words in the 101st section of the Doctrine and Covenants. Then in the 98th section, he spells out the kind of men we ought to elect to public office. And he makes it very clear that we're entitled to freedom. And then he tells the kind of man. They must be good men and wise men and honest men. But if you elect that kind, they're bound to pass good legislation. And so uh, I know the Lord inspired the founding fathers. And I'm so grateful. I was so grateful as a young missionary on my return home to read for the first time that these founding fathers had appeared in one of our temples to Wilfred Woodruff in St. George and ask why the work hadn't been done for them. And so I'm sure that the Lord selected the very best men he could find at the time to establish the Constitution of this land. And I love the Constitution, and I love America. I love the Stars and Stripes. I'm grateful to be a citizen. I hardly ever go abroad and return home, but I don't thank the Lord for this country. And I often think of the words of Scott, Breathe there a man with soul so dead who never to himself has said, this is my own, my, na my native land. Are the words of Van Dyke. It's nice to see the old world and travel up and down among the famous palaces and cities of renown to view the crumbly castles and statues of kings. But now I think I've had enough of antiquated things. 
So it's home again, and home again, America for me. I want a ship that's westward bound to plow the rolling sea, to the land of youth and freedom beyond the ocean bars, where the air is full of freedom and the flag is full of stars. That's the way I feel regarding America. And I thank the Lord that the gospel has been restored here, that the keys of the priesthood and the authority have been restored here, and that this is the large base of operations. President Benson's many years of church service have been an inspiration to many. Hundreds of thousands of members of the church from all around the world have been blessed by the strength of his testimony. I say to my posterity and to the world that I know this work is true the greatest work in all the world. I know that the greatest event that has transpired in this world since the resurrection of the Master was the appearance of God the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ, to Joseph Smith, who later became the prophet of this dispensation. These things I know with all my heart. I know them as I know that I live. And I'm grateful beyond expression for my testimony and the opportunity and blessing which is mine and has been mine. And for our posterity, for their righteous lives and their devotion to the King.